You are listening to Gone But Never Forgotten. Our topics can include, but are not limited to, murder, sexual assault, graphic and gruesome details, and more. These topics are adult in nature and are not meant for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. As we all know, life can be a struggle at the best of times. This thing that we all wake up to face every day called life is far from easy for many of us, and we just try to do the best that we can. One of the things that most of us fear is having our lives put under a microscope and having every decision that we have ever made be analyzed by people we know and even strangers. This week's episode is one that is filled with so much tragedy that it was definitely even harder to research and put together than most. We have the obvious tragedy of a young life that has disappeared, and we also have the tragedy that is today's culture of trying to point fingers and be the first to figure out what happened. Often forgetting that the people at the center of the story are exactly that, people. We have seemingly left behind the sentiment of innocent before proven guilty, and sadly that mentality really does tend to hurt even more people than it helps. Many of us content creators that do true crime do it so that we can get new eyes and ears on stories so that we can perhaps help, but this story will show us the dark side of that reality as well. A three-year-old boy goes missing in Nova Scotia, and the repercussions for the entire family are even deeper and more hurtful and harmful than one can even imagine. And welcome to episode 17 of Gone But Never Forgotten, the sad story of Dylan Ehler. This one will pull at your heartstrings and will hopefully give us a pause when we think about the way that we attack true crime stories and vilify people quickly in the court of public opinion. But before we get to that, let's tone down the seriousness for just a moment if we can. Lance, how are you doing? Uh... I'm doing all right, you know, um, as we record this, we're a couple weeks out from Christmas, so we've got all that fun stress and good stuff going on, and <laughs> just ready for some holidays and hopefully a chance to refresh. Yeah, definitely bring in a little bit of joy in this time, that's for sure. Yeah, I agree. Well, I think that it's about time that we dive headlong into this terrible story that really lays out a lot of the pain that is felt by family friends, and everyone else that is involved when something terrible like this happened. Let's learn about Dylan Ehler and all of the side stories and sadness that comes along with a missing child. May 6, 2020, with the world reeling and struggling already with the spread of COVID and the depression, darkness, and pain that was already being felt with that, a family had no idea that things were about to become infinitely worse for them. That was the day that Dylan Ehler was visiting with his maternal grandma in Truro, Nova Scotia, and he would go missing in a very short moment when her back was turned. Now, 19 months later, there are still no answers as to what happened to Dylan. Let's start off by telling the tales of earlier and happier times. Dylan Ehler was born in April of 2017 to his parents, Ashley Brown and Jason Ehler. They all shared a gray-green house in Bible Hill near Truro, Nova Scotia. It is said that Dylan was an incredibly active little guy right from birth. It seemed that he never stopped moving and he never stopped keeping his parents on their toes at all times. Dylan was always exploring and looking for new places to check out and new trouble to get into, so to speak. Ashley and Jason say that it was not unusual to turn your back for a moment, walk back into the living room, 
and find Dylan perched up on the windowsill and trying to reach up for the ledge above it. Forever exploring, forever moving, and forever looking for a new adventure and a new way to scare the bejesus out of his parents, no doubt. When Dylan was first brought home by his parents, the three of them slept together in the living room, finding room on the sectional couch. It seems that Dylan rather enjoyed sharing the same sleeping space with his parents, as even after his third birthday, he was forever finding his way out of his bed and bedroom and climbing into bed with his parents. Reading about Dylan reminded me a lot of our son, as it seems that even though he was incredibly hyperactive, he didn't speak much at all at the age of three. The only words that he could say were mama and dada, but much like our son, he always found ways to communicate with his family. Jason says that Dylan had a penchant for tugging at your hand and tugging at your heartstrings to lead you to wherever he wanted you and wanted your attention. He sounds like a lovely little man. He really does. The wonderful thing about children, especially at that age, is that they don't really know what's going on around them. They're just happy to just be. And always looking for the next laugh, adventure, and excitement. Life for Jason and Ashley was not always easy. Much like many of us in that lower to middle class of Canada, life consisted of living from paycheck to paycheck and doing everything imaginable to make ends meet for themselves, for Dylan, and for his 12-year-old stepsister, Lily. I think that that is a plight that many of us know all too well. As Dylan passed his third birthday in April of 2020, the family was finding themselves in a position that was even more dire than usual. Their town, much like most of Canada, was in a state of lockdown because of the pandemic surrounding COVID. Ashley and Jason both lost their jobs, there were issues with their neighbors, and Lily was staying home because she was remote learning for school. So, the house was abnormally full during this time, and obviously tensions were rising and stress was ever-present because of all these situations. Yeah, the entire pandemic has certainly been horrible for so many people. Routines have changed, jobs have been lost, and so much more turmoil was caused during our rolling lockdowns and everything that's come with that. Certainly not a way that I ever thought that we would have to live within our lifetime. And yet, as we said, Dylan was tearing through that house as though there wasn't a care in the world. Oh, to be a kid again. One thing that many people don't know is that Nova Scotia, for many years, was actually known as the lost person capital of North America. As beautiful as the scenery is in Nova Scotia, ripe with trees of many kinds and wild and dense vegetation, it also made for a prime problem. That being people going for a walk or a hike and then realizing that they didn't know where they were, or worse yet, how to get out of the area that they were in. Everything can start to look the same in those circumstances. Yes, and sadly that fact comes into play a little later here with this story. The pandemic, as we all know, began to really drag on. Weeks turned into months, and months have now turned into years. Yes, and speaking from personal experience, I can say that I've changed a lot during this pandemic, and I would venture to say that those changes have not necessarily all been good ones. It's been much the same for many people, and for Jason and Ashley, it seems like it was much the same for them. In early May of 2020, Jason and Ashley awoke to a situation that was bad from the very start. The neighbor, who they'd had some issues with, had a buddy that was banging on their windows and yelling and screaming. That caused Jason to get out of bed furious, as I think anyone would really do in that situation. Things between the two, though, escalated very quickly in the anger and the stress of that morning. Ashley doesn't remember what caused the quick escalation, but the end result was that she hit Jason. In retaliation, Jason was out of bed like a shot, and everyone was yelling and the situation was escalating quickly. Jason yelled that he would kill Ashley, and he took her phone and smashed it on the kitchen floor. Someone overheard everything, it would seem, and the police were called. Ashley was charged with assault, and Jason was charged with mischief and uttering threats. The two were released, and a court date was set for later that summer. The judge also ordered the couple to have no contact in the meantime, 
with their moms acting as go-betweens for them. Ashley stayed at home and looked after Dylan and Lily, while Jason stayed with his parents about 15 minutes away. Things were contentious between everyone, as obviously the situation caused a lot of stress, as any massive changes like this in these situations can do. On the morning of May 6, 2020, Ashley took Dylan out for breakfast, and later that day she got a message from a friend asking if she wanted to go out. Ashley knew that she needed the break as she was exhausted, so she asked her mom if she could look after Dylan for a little while. Her mom agreed and Ashley delivered Dylan and a bag of necessities to her mother's house. The area where Ashley's mom lived was far from ideal. Even small places like Truro have areas that many would call the slums, so to speak. And that is that what the area where she lived in is referred to by many of the people who live within the area. Dylan, though, loved going to visit his grandma, as she had a puppy who was one of the few living things in the world that was able to run, play, and just go at the same speed that Dylan was used to running at. Dorothy, Ashley's mom, said that she was going to let the two play and burn off some steam in the backyard, and, the t and she joked with her daughter that maybe they should put the puppy and Dylan on a leash because they were both apt to run and never stop. Ashley pulled out of the driveway shortly after 11 a.m., and little did she know the horror that was about to overtake her, her family, and their small town. At about 1.15 p.m., Dorothy was in the backyard with Dylan and the puppy, and she says she turned her back for only a short moment to tie the puppy to his lead. When she turned around again, Dylan was nowhere to be seen. Frantically, Dorothy looked around the yard then ran into the street calling his name, and the calls turned into screams, and she started screaming for the neighbors to call 911 for her, as her grandson was gone. A 911 call was made, and only four minutes later, the police showed up on the scene and immediately joined in the hunt, fanning out in the area to try and find Dylan as quickly as possible. Ashley's father drove over quickly to her friend's house to pick her up, drive her over and give her the horrifying news that Dylan had ran off from the backyard and that a full-scale search was in effect. At this point, with her mind racing, Ashley tried to focus in on the fact that they would likely find Dylan before she even arrived. Ashley knew her son, and she knew that he had a playful spirit. As such, she was sure that his imagination had simply got the best of him and that he would be found somewhere quickly. Sadly, though, this was not to be. Firefighters, police officers, search and rescue, everyone was called in to search the area to try and find young Dylan. People were searching every nook and cranny that they could, including walking through the river that was waist deep and fanning out from the home. Six long hours were spent without anyone finding so much as a trace of Dylan in the area. However, as you can imagine, sometimes finding a trace can be even more ominous than not. This was one of those times for sure. A volunteer came across a little boot that was in a shopping cart that has, had been left abandoned in Leper Brook, and it was indeed quickly deemed to have belonged to Dylan. Then, about 90 minutes later, another volunteer pulled the matching boot stuck in mud about 60 feet downstream from the first. At this point, things were really not looking good. For days, the search continued. People everywhere were engrossed by the story. Across the province, people took to leaving boots out on their steps as a beacon of hope for Dylan that he would be found and to show the solidarity and support for him and his family. Obviously, at this point, a lot of the efforts were centered in and around the water. The idea that most people seem to be going with at this point was that Dylan had made a run for it and found himself quickly at the nearby creek. At his young age, Dylan had not yet learned how to swim. Dive teams took to the water, underwater cameras were used to skim and hopefully find anything that they may have missed previously, and helicopters flew in low over the area looking for anything that looked out of the ordinary. Ashley and Jason took to social media to try and help keep the news flowing, keep Dylan's picture spreading as far as it could, and to coordinate searches and align assistance in any way that they could. 
Social media can be a wonderful way to coordinate and find more volunteers and just keep everything and anything in the public eye. Of course, time is of the essence. Sadly though, as anyone who has been through a situation like this knows, or for that matter, anyone who uses social media knows, social media can quickly become a cesspool. Mix that with the internet detective crowd that descends any time that a story like this is in the news, and you often do get a few bad apples that can quickly turn to rumors, lies, and painful sentiments that spread like wildfire. Yes, and after two days of Dylan being missing, that is exactly what happened here. Ashley's sister-in-law told her to stay clear of social media, but it was already too late. Message boards, inboxes, and the like were filling up with a new theory. The theory was that Ashley was public enemy number one in the disappearance of her son. Yeah, Ashley's TikTok account had been uncovered by some of these so-called internet sleuths, and they had found a couple of videos of Ashley that they decided were evidence of problems. One such video was part of a wider spread parody on the internet of one of the songs from the movie Frozen. The video was taken in April, and Ashley had sung along with the words to the dark parody, quote, Will you help me find a body? Come on, we can't delay. No one can see him on the floor. Get him out the door before he can decay. So an internet fad that many, many people had taken part in was seen as the reason that Ashley was viewed as a suspect by the general public at large? Sadly, yes. And I can think of very few things that could make an already bad situation worse like this. You go from being heartbroken and torn apart at the disappearance of your son to being hung by the jury of public opinion, hiding at home behind their computer screens and digging up dirt and sending you messages around the clock. What a horrible situation. Yeah, that's truly awful. Social media can truly be your best friend and your worst enemy all at the same time. People ran down Ashley for getting a haircut and even took issue with the fact that Jason was sleeping at all, saying that they would not be stopping for rest if this was their child that was missing. Everyone has an opinion, right? Sadly, though, people need to learn when to keep them to themselves at times. This is one of those times. I agree. I don't pretend to know what was happening here or what happened to Dylan, but certainly I also don't know how I would react in a situation like this. Nobody really does until they're living it, and all you can do is hope that you never have to live it. As if their lives were not already in tatters, things just continued to get worse for Ashley and Jason. People started to arrive outside their home, taking pictures, following them wherever they went, and just generally stalking them. Even an employee at the hospital partook in a privacy breach and looked up health information on Ashley, Jason, and Dylan. Absolutely horrible. And maybe the most sickening of all, when the family built a memorial for Dylan with some personal items, people came and tore the memorial apart and even dug a hole in the ground underneath it, claiming to be searching for a body or evidence. During all of this, sadly, no further answers were being uncovered. No more evidence was found. After six days, the search was called off by police. Jason continued to walk the creek bed, and the money that was raised by a GoFundMe was offered up as a reward. As we don't feel that this is part of the story that should be looked at deeply, we will just gloss over this part. But a lawyer was made aware of the cyberbullying that took place towards the entire family, but especially towards Jason and Ashley, and there were cease and desist orders made and lawsuits filed against the people that were harassing on a daily basis. This, of course, made for a muddy situation, and even more people judging Jason and Ashley because they could not believe that the couple had time to file lawsuits while their son was missing. Absolutely disgusting. I mean, yeah, in situations like this, you do look at people close to the situation at first as like potential suspects, but to go to the lengths that people were going makes me absolutely sick to my stomach. There is a massive difference, in my opinion, between what we do, 
trying to tell stories of those that are still unresolved and these people who feel that they're entitled to search, dig, harass, and disrupt a family even more, if that is even possible. If you're one of these people, you should frankly be ashamed of yourself. There's helping, and then there's being a sickening part of the problem. When the police state that they don't believe that a case involves any foul play, and also states that the family is not being looked at, it makes you wonder why the untrained masses would believe that their quote-unquote research is more valuable than the police. I'll avoid this rabbit hole for today, though, and get off of my soapbox. In mid-2021, after refusals from Facebook group organizers, who we will leave nameless because they don't deserve the recognition or name drop, the Nova Scotia Supreme Court pressed down and forced the permanent closure of the groups in question that had thousands of followers and thousands of horrifying comments towards the family. Yep, <clears throat> let's stay on track here. To this day, Jason goes out nearly every day to hike, search, and try to find his son. He hasn't given up hope, even though he acknowledges that the support has definitely diminished. The family has even considered moving away to try and start fresh somewhere else, but they find that they're unable to do so until they find some answers. There is also seemingly a large amount of bad blood between the family, especially Jason, and the Truro Police Department, as there have been many marches to try and gain visibility, and many attempts to try and get the police to look at the case renewed again. On the flip side, the police seem to view the desperation and the ways that Jason tries to get renewed attention as not the proper way to go about things. Yeah, I'll always stand by something that I say and live by though. Nobody, and I mean nobody, has the right to tell anyone how to grieve in any situation. And I think that that holds truer than ever when it comes to a missing child. There's no amount of time that can pass that will ease that kind of pain. There is no right way to handle the situation. This family doesn't know, regardless of what the police say, if their child was kidnapped or if he wandered off, and worst of all, they don't know for sure what happened to him. One of the main issues centers around the fact that the police seemingly only approached this case from the very outset as a case of a toddler who ran off. The case was never really viewed as a criminal case, and that definitely bothers the family, because they feel, rightfully so, that all avenues should have been investigated. Toro Police Chief Dave McNeil does stand by the way that the case was handled, however. He says, quote, We're very confident in our investigation. It was very thorough. There was no stone left unturned. He does stand by the fact that the case was indeed investigated as a potential crime and as a search and rescue operation. The family also is working with people of the public who agree with them in how the case was handled. There is an online petition with just over 3,000 signatures as we speak that is aiming to create a new alert system. The aim would be for there to be an alert immediately sent out whenever a child goes missing. The petition states, quote, We believe these circumstances should require an instant public notification. When any child goes missing, time is of the essence, and sometimes the assembly of search and rescue efforts takes up too much crucial time in the safe recovery of that child, unquote. My name was definitely added to the petition as I was researching this case. I firmly plant my name behind this cause. As my note on change.org states, if even one life could be saved, this program would be incredibly valuable. As we always do, we want to appeal to the public for help. If you know anything about what happened to Dylan, please let someone know. Whether you saw this little guy walking off alone, or you know that something more sinister took place, please pass along that information if you have not done so previously. You can contact the Truro Police at 902-895-5351 or call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-TIPS. At the time of Dylan's disappearance, as mentioned, he was three years old. He was roughly three feet tall and 32 pounds. 
He had brown hair and his eyes were heterochromatic with his left eye being hazel and his right eye being half hazel and half blue split vertically. He was wearing a red dino t-shirt, camouflaged jogging pants, a green winter jacket with American patches, and it also had a faux fur hood and an orange liner. Again, if you do know anything, please make a call or go online and let someone know. We will close with what Tom Fitzpatrick, the president of the team that led the ground search, hypothesizes to have happened that day. This is pulled from Wired.com's coverage of the story. Quote, Nature was working against Dylan from square one. The banks of the brook were so swollen that the currents knocked full-grown men off their feet. Fitzpatrick's crew has spent almost 6,000 hours searching for Dylan, speaking to fishers and beachcombers and tidal experts to better understand what they're up against. They've searched racetracks, gravel pits, cheese factories, anywhere else that there's been a tip or a possible sighting. Fitzpatrick is watchful, peering out of his car windows for scavenging birds or misshapen lumps of clay when he crosses the river each day. Four members of his crew have left the team, unable to cope with the unanswered questions still swirling around the case. Did I miss him? Did I miss something? Fitzpatrick says. That's a heavy load to carry home. Fitzpatrick is confident he knows what happened that day. We think the child was in the backyard and his grandmother got distracted. We're not sure by what and not sure how long. We think the child went out the corner of the yard behind the neighbor's house. There's a path that leads down to the brook and just below there's a bit of a log jam, he says, pausing. About 50 feet down the water from there is where we found the first boot. He can't bring himself to say it exactly, that the boy was caught up in the tides so forceful and thick with mud that underwater it's impossible to see. This one tore me apart as I researched it. The loss of a child, the treatment of the family, the disgusting actions of the online public. I, I just don't even know what to say here. Julie, anything you want to add? Um, yeah, this one is really sad. I mean, it's always sad when it's a child, but it's, there's no answers and there's a lot of questions, right? Like things happen quickly with kids. They're, they don't think about the things we think about. Um, and it's just tragic that, you know, there was a creek like right nearby, you know, there's so many questions with this one, to be honest with you. Yeah. I've kind of alluded to it as we were going through and in, in my show notes and such, but like, this one just makes me angry. I mean, I get it. I understand that people think that they're helping when they act in different ways. But dragging a family over the coals when the police aren't looking at them as suspects, it just seems wrong to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Like, these two people and the family at large don't need and didn't need this extra stress and this bullying. And... We live in this era where people have taken their own lives because of some of the stuff that Ashley and Jason were going through. Like, it's just, it, it honestly makes me sick to my stomach. Yeah. I mean, I understand, like, where you're coming from, obviously, and I don't think it's okay what they did. But I think when it comes to a case of a child, everybody gets disturbed or you know gets emotional about it so i think in a way even the public was grieving this horrible situation were they grieving in the right way no but i think it just goes to show that when something happens to a child we're all very much something happens to us inside of us it's just absolutely horrifying but something happened inside of you but could you imagine going could you imagine setting up a memorial for your kid and people tear it down and dig there because they think that you are marking his grave. Oh, for That's sure. That's disgusting. And I'm not, I'm not agreeing with that. I'm just saying that, you know, when it comes to a child case, it's just not the same as any other case. It's just different. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I don't want to get too deep into my rampage against social media because obviously in cases like this, it's helped in some cases, but... 
just the lengths that people go to. And I think, I honestly think that like this pandemic has made it worse. Everyone thinks that they're like king shit when they're sitting behind their computer monitor and they can say and do whatever they want. Yeah, I mean, I will say if you are like the public in this situation, use your social media to help and, you know, be a kind and loving towards the families and be a support system for them, you know, because they're already dealing with so much mental stress and their mental health, like, you know, telling them that they can't, like, how dare you sleep, you know what I mean? Like, be a support system for that person. Give them the strength to continue this search because ultimately we're all fighting for the victim. Yeah, like, how, how good are you going to be at searching if you haven't slept for three days? You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. I just, anyways. I think we'll call it a wrap here on this one. I hope and pray for the family of Dylan that they find answers so that they can try to move on with their lives in whatever way is possible after such a tragedy. This one is fresher and newer than many of the stories that we cover, which makes it hit home, I think, a little more. I hope that the hunt for answers doesn't end and that somehow we can provide some small measure of help also in ensuring that even though Dylan is gone, he is not and his story is not ever forgotten.